Okay, so in this lecture, we're picking up right where René Descartes left off. Um, when he left off, um, he makes us out as humans to be dualist, a mind and a body, and having certain ideas that are called innate ideas that do not rely on seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching the five senses for their existence. Uh, John Locke wrote the book, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, um, where he's trying to kind of wrestle with some of the stuff that uh, René Descartes left us. John Locke is considered a father also. He's considered the father of empiricism, the theory that all ideas or content in the mind arises directly or indirectly from sense experience and nowhere else. All right. Um, in fact, pretty much all of uh, current uh, science concerning the mind and the brain agrees with this, and Locke was the first one to kind of really push it. So, empiricism, all ideas in your mind, directly or indirectly, come from seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Um, John Locke tells us in the book early on that before a person is born, their mind is a tabula rasa, or a blank slate, or an empty dry erase board, you could say. Um, and so basically what he's saying is that the, the mind is empty before birth, right? And then once you're born, then, you know, the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, begin to register sensations of the outside world, red, the voice of mama, the touch of the blankie on your skin, and also begins to register reflections, which are awarenesses of the processes within the mind like affirming and doubting and remembering and emoting, right? Uh, emotional feelings is part of reflection. These are like inner sensations in a way. The sensation of the mind instead of the sensations of the, of the senses. So sensations are reflection. Inner experience, outer experience kind of begin to register as soon as you're born as these external and internal impressions, right, the sensations and the reflections, begin to repeat, we begin to develop what we call, what he calls simple ideas, right? Um, like um, the ideas of mama, right? Or food, or red, right? If you think about it, your concept of red in your head is not made from just one particular red, but from a collection of multiple reds. <clears throat> your idea of mama is not based off one particular memory of your mom, right? But from a collection of different times seeing, hearing, smelling, t taste, well, hearing, seeing, touching, and feeling emotionally things with your mom, right? Those things all kind of collect together to create the simple idea of mother. Eventually, the mind becomes capable of thinking about sensation, thinking about reflection, and thinking about simple ideas in order to arrive at complex ideas, um, like cause and effect, family, justice, infinity, God, etc. So, I, I, you know, from your simple ideas about your mother, here simple doesn't mean like it's not complicated. Here it just means like from the simple idea of one particular mother, which is yours, you begin to kind of make bigger ideas, more complex ideas about motherhood in general, right? And mothers from around the world, right? And so 
sensations and reflections build up to become simple ideas, simple ideas build up to become complex ideas. Notice this is where we get back to Descartes. Locke rejects Descartes completely. There are no innate ideas. Something like God or infinity for Locke are complex ideas, right? The reason, you know, we've, we've never seen infinity, but we have simple ideas like uh, limit, right? For example, the limit of the edge of the table. The table comes to an end. And you have a little card and you roll it. Eventually it falls off because there's no more table. So from the idea of an end or a limit. And then we also have the simple idea of no, right? From how many times mom and dad tell us no, right? No, don't eat that. No, don't touch this. No. We put the two ideas together to create no limit. No boundary, no end, and that's what I—that's what infinity is, right? So the point that that Locke is making is that there are no innate ideas. When there's all ideas depend directly or indirectly on the senses and our understanding of the world around us. So this kind of explains how the mind works, right? Um, and then Locke moves on to try to talk about the self, which is another metaphysical question, right? What exactly is the self? Uh, remember that in metaphysics, the self, me, I, versus you, right, is something that separates you from others in space, right? I'm over here, you're over there. But at the same time, unites me with earlier versions of me in the past and with future versions of me in the future, right? Whatever theory you come up with about what makes you you, self, personal identity, has to do both. It has to separate you from other people in space, but it has to connect you to the previous yous and the later yous across time, right? So how does Locke answer that? So. John Locke tells us that what makes you, you, right? What makes you a self is the continuity of your mind's presence within this particular body across space and time. In other words, right? The fact that you always, you always are that mind that is particularly in that body today, tomorrow, last week, next year, 10 years ago, right? Every time you close your eyes and go to sleep, when you wake up, you're that same mind in that same body and you pick up right where you left off, right? That this is what creates a continuity, right? Like it, con it connects you to you from yesterday and from 100 years ago or 100 years from now, etc. right? Like no matter when you are or where you are, Right, that same mind is connected to that same body, and it's always kind of following along, kind of like an audience or, or, or an eyewitness to the events of the body. This is what connects you to you, it makes you you, right? So, notice that one thing John Locke is doing is he's kind of picking up on Descartes' dualism, right? He buys into it. Basically, there's a duality of mind and body. And those are connected across time. And that's what makes us each who we are, right? And so that's Locke's theory of personal identity or his theory of self. Now, that could create some problems in terms of uh, what are called thought experiments, right? Thought experiments are where you think of something that might be possible in the future in order to test the theory today. So at some point in the future, it might be possible to download your consciousness into another body or into an artificial body. It might be possible to transplant two people's brains. What happens to Locke's theory then, right? Let's say that you um, have 
let's say a terrible accident, your body is no longer repairable, but your brain is still working just fine. Um, they put your brain in my body. I know it's scary, right? Um, because, you know, something happened to my brain, but the rest of my body was fine, and I donated it to science. So now your brain is in my body. At first, notice you still think of yourself in someone else's body. But what happens 25 years later? Right? By by 25 years later, you've created a new continuity of a mind with a new body that didn't exist before, right? Some of you might say, well, I'm still me. What is, who is me, right? You you can't tell me that you're still 25 years later in, in this thing right here, that you're still going to be you. Your family, you know, even if you prove to them that you are who you are, they're always going to have trouble reacting to you the way they used to react to you. Not only your family, your friends, society as a whole. Society as a whole is going to treat you like a uh, 6'5", 275-pound, 51-year-old male. Um, not like, you know, whatever you guys are, right? Uh, let's say 20-year-old um, female or whatever, right? Weighs 120 pounds, 5'5". Five five. Um, as the world begins to react to you, as the society begins to react to you differently for 25 years, right, you begin to remember experiences differently, right? You have new experiences, new ways of being treated, new emotional responses. So what happens, right? Are you a new self? Uh, for, for Locke's theory, you are no longer you, but you're not me either. You're something def different. You become a third person, right? One that is not you, but is also not me. And is that really an answer we like? Uh, probably not. So one of the things I'm trying to get you to realize is that these theories, right, it's good to examine what are the consequences of these theories. Where do they take us? What do we end up believing if we buy into some of these theories. And that's exactly what our next thinker does, right? David Hume uh, comes in right after John Locke. Notice a similarity on the title. An inquiry concerning human understanding as opposed to an essay concerning human understanding. Hume read Locke, and he's heavily influenced by Locke. Um, and so David Hume is going to kind of pick up right where, where John Locke left off. David Hume is what we call a true skeptic. He doubts conventional assumptions and commonly held beliefs. He does not take anything for granted. He examines things in order to see if they hold up to doubt. Um, he starts off by agreeing with everything John Locke just discussed above, 100%. He thinks John Locke's right about empiricism. He thinks he's he right about the tabula rasa as the mind when you're born. He thinks he's right about sensation and reflection and simple ideas and complex ideas. He thinks John Locke is right when it comes to continuity of the mind and the body, uh, you know, across time and space equals personal identity, right? So he agrees with John Locke in everything. However, he does not think John Locke fully explored the consequences of these theories, kind of like what we were just doing right now at the end. So Hume decides, okay, let me kind of take what, he, what he's been talking about and let's kind of really flesh it out and see where does this, where does this take us, right? And so the uh, first thing uh, David Hume points out is, look, if all ideas in your mind, right, sensation, reflection, simple idea, complex idea, doesn't matter, if all of them come from your personal experiences of the five senses, then, Hume argues, knowledge is arrived at through a process of induction. Induction is where your general truths about the world are basically patterns of similarity found amongst 
a series of individual cases, right? So we go from individual experiences to come up with general rules about how we think the world works. A general truth created from specific individual experiences. For example, your, you know, uh, as we mentioned before, your concept of red is based off of many different reds you grew up seeing as a, as a small child, right? You would see like the red of Santa Claus, the red of the apple, um, you know, the, the red of a particular sunset on, on certain skies. And from there, those reds kind of create the concept red, the general truth of red, right? Same thing for green and blue and man and woman and fathers and mothers. These kind of big ideas, justice, truth, right, are created from a bunch of specific things that happened to you in the past. So induction is the process by which we gain knowledge for Hume. This means that an understanding of the world derived from induction, which means derived from a finite number of specific sense experiences limits all human ideas to either more probable or less probable, but never 100% certain, right? So, I mean, if I assume the, you know, let's say I assume the sun is rising tomorrow, right? Because for 51 years, every single morning the sun rose plus for 75 years that my mom ro has been alive the sun rose plus 70 years before that that my grandfather woke up the sun rose plus 75 years before that that my great-grandfather rose up so but notice even if i add up all the days that i woke up my mom woke up my grandfather woke up my great-grandfather woke up great great grandfather and take it back to all of my ancestors and I come up with you know 999 billion 999 million 999 thousand 999 times that the Sun rose it does not guarantee that it will happen on the one trillionth time right behavior and actions in the past do not guarantee or control actions in the future there is not a hundred percent certainty about anything that we think we know because you know we've only seen it in the past that doesn't guarantee it in the future because what we know and understand is a product of induction it's a product of past individual cases right so notice in the next uh, bullet right Hume tells us there is no certain knowledge of truth with a capital T possible for human beings, right? We merely have ideas in our mind that are either more probable or less likely, right? Is it likely the sun is gonna rise tomorrow? Yes, it's more likely that it is than that it's not because we have, you know, what, six, uh, you know, tw you know, 6.4 billion years of mornings rising up for the earth right so is it likely yeah it's probably likely right but we don't know for sure i could die tonight in my sleep uh there could be an eclipse that makes it seem like the sun didn't um you know i could be abducted and wake up on another planet so that the sun isn't rising for me in the morning right the sun could go supernova the earth could be pulled in by a gravitational pull into another planet and we collide the milky way galaxy uh, crosses with another galaxy and coincidentally or enough two stars including our sun crash into each other i mean there's a lot of things that can happen are they likely no they are not likely the point here for hume is that the you know some things are more 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 likely but never for sure right and this begins to kind of create some doubt in our minds about what we know. For Hume, that's a good thing. We have to have doubt about what we know. Um, you have to remember, uh, 
David Hume is living in a very bloody time period in uh, Europe's history. I mean, when is Europe's history not a bloody time period, right? But the, the point is that um, for Hume, there's a lot of people killing each other based on what they know, right? They know the Protestant religion is better than the Catholic religion or that the Catholic religion is better than the Protestant religion. They know that being a royalist who follows the kings and queens is the, is the right way to be. Or they know that being democratic and fighting for you know rights of people and individuals is the right thing, right? There's a, there's a lot of certain knowledge that people take for granted that Hume's trying to prove you don't really have. And, and if some of you are having trouble understanding why Hume's telling you, you know, why he's adamant about this, or you know, you just don't buy into what he's saying. Think about the reaction people have when they're like in their 20s and 30s and they find out that they were adopted for the first time, right? People's entire like world comes crashing down on them. Now for us, a lot of us, it's hard to understand. We're like, why are you overreacting so much? You know, they, you still have people who love you, right? But what it's hard for us to understand is they're, they're, they're finally kind of uh, realizing what David Hume is kind of saying. Um, they're, they're recognizing that like something they took for granted as true, this is my mother, this is my father, these are my brothers, or, or this is my family, right? That, that suddenly they, that's shattered completely. That's not your mother. She did not give you birth, right? Like what something they thought was a pillar of truth in their lives, something they knew for granted, right, begins to shake their faith in all truth. They begin to realize what can we be certain of? Right? And so that's why they struggle with it psych you know, um, psychologically when they find out that late in the game. Um, they're kind of waking up to the crisis that Hume is kind of talking about here. No certain knowledge, 100% certainty of truth is possible. In fact, Hume's point here is that certainty is not a guarantee of knowledge or truth. Certainty is a feeling. All right, so Hume is trying to make you recognize that certainty is a feeling. In the same way that your feelings can be right or wrong, justified or not justified, is the same way that certainty can be right or wrong, can be justified or not justified. There are certain things you are certain of that you are wrong about in terms of reality outside your head. And Hume wants you to wake up to that. Now, Worse still, Hume points out that there are also something called natural beliefs. These are ideas that humans need to use as part of their processing to make sense of the world around them, right? And the thing is, is that like, as science progresses, it repeatedly proves that these ideas do not exist independently of your human mind, right? So, in other words, there are certain ideas we have in our head that we need to understand to make sense of the world around us, but these natural beliefs are actually not real, right? Science proves that these natural beliefs don't exist outside of our heads, that they're not true, right? But even though they're not true, we still need them to function, right? For example, uh, you know, people have no choice like even the scientist who proves that a natural belief is not true still ends up using the natural belief in their mind as they navigate through reality, right? These natural beliefs are essential for human consciousness to function within an external reality. So what exactly are examples of these natural beliefs? For Hume, self, right? Self or personal identity, me, I. I am a fiction that I create for myself to help me function as an organism moving around in a natural environment, right? Free will, the, the idea that I can freely choose, you know, what to eat or what career to follow or who to ask out on a date or whether to lie or not about something, right? This idea that I'm freely choosing 
that I'm not a puppet of cause and effect, right? That's another natural belief. Uh, what what Hume is kind of already recognizing in his time is that you know self and free will and even cause and effect that these are things that are not necess- that are not proven in fact they're often disproven by science and yet even the scientist needs to think of themselves as a self right I mean think about it when a scientist tries to prove that there's no that the self is not real, right? That when you die, it ceases to exist. Um, That person still thinks of themselves as a self, right? They still are walking in their head, walking around with inside their head going, here I am, what am I gonna eat today? What, you know, what am I gonna wear? Should I ask this person out, et cetera, right? Like they still assume free will is true. They still assume cause and effect are true. They still assume the self is real, even though they just finished writing an essay proving that that stuff is not real. Because these natural beliefs, even if they're not real, we still need them to function as human beings, right? So, uh, what is the self, right? If itself is not real for, for Hume, this is where he comes up with the bundle theory of the self, right? Uh, think of a bundle of laundry, right? You have a bundle of laundry in your arm. You're walking to the laundromat two weeks, two blocks away. As you're walking with the bundle of laundry, you notice, you know, or maybe you don't notice, you dropped a sock, then you dropped some boxers, then you dropped a t-shirt, then you dropped a sweater, then you dropped a pair of jeans, right? And as you begin to drop things, by the time you get to the laundromat, there is no bundle right because each thing was removed the same thing is true here in the bundle theory of self or Hume Um, he thinks that the self uh, is is not an independent thing there's not like a little driver inside of you like in uh, uh, men in black right there's not a little alien inside of you moving this machine around that we call the body there's no independent mind or self what, what we call me and uh, and you, right? What we call the self or the mind or who I really am, for, for Hume, it's just a bundle, right? It's just a bundle of thoughts, feelings, beliefs, memories, emotions, likes, dislikes, right? It's just a bunch of things wrapped up together that, that arise as reactions to sense stimuli. In other words, you, you're walking around and you feel a breeze and you think, ooh, it's chilly. Then a part of you thinks, oh, I should have gotten a sweater. And then another part of you thinks, I really need to do better about checking the, the weather before I leave the house, right? So the, the point is like that Hume's making is like what you call me is just really a, a bundle of reactions to hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, right? Um, You don't choose to lift your hand and wave. You are caused to lift your hand and wave by either making eye contact, uh, some part of you that wants to, um, you know, please people and be on their good side. That goes back to your childhood, right? You, 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 You see somebody you recognize that is on your good side and so you wave or you don't wave because you see someone you recognize that upset you, right? And now you're trying to ignore them. So the the point here is that like, what you think is you going around making choices is actually just like a bundle of reactions, reactions in here and reactions out here to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And so what Hume points out is if there's no sense stimuli, like when you die, there's no bundle of reactions, and therefore there is no self, right? So for David Hume, the bundle disappears once the senses disappear. Um, if any of you have ever, you know, had the difficulty of being around someone when they're passing away at the moment that they're actually passing away, um, you know as well as I do that they begin to lose the senses, right? Uh, they begin to feel cold because they can't feel touch. 
they begin to have a hard time hearing because they lose hearing. And eventually, they begin to see darkness, right? Uh, they, they don't see you anymore because they can't see. So as the body begins to shut down, it shuts down the senses. And for David Hume, once those senses are shut down, there's no longer anything to react to. So then the reactions shut down, which means you shut down and you come to an end because there is no you independent of those reactions. Right? Now, even if you accept everything Hume's going to say, you're still going to think of you as a you when you close this laptop, right? And go about your business because you need to believe in you in order to function as a human being. That's a natural belief. Um, so Hume goes on to attack all the other natural beliefs as well. But I just wanted to give you a taste for it um, in this lecture. Um, I hope you enjoy, you know, John Locke and David Hume. If you are a psychology major or, you know, future psychiatrist and you did not like these theories at all, eh, you may want to think about it. Maybe you're in the wrong field. All right. Um, but this kind of concludes the lecture for today. And then we'll be back with another lecture next time.